people have opinions without being fully informed. Trust me, I'm a Canadian here. I don't care if you're a Christian, Messianic, or Hebrew roots. I want to know if your theology is biblical. Maybe I'm right. Of course I'm right. If you're going to cite a source, be responsible. You know, cite your source. Your mom goes to college. Hey, we're just having a conversation. There's only 36 people listening anyway, right? You can Google it. Wow, at what point does history matter? At what point does truth matter? An alien invasion. Is it biblical? Of course it is. Look, there's a way to do scholarship and a way not to do scholarship. you got to set your source. Who's your source? My best friend's sister's boyfriend's brother's girlfriend heard from this guy who knows his kid is going with the girl. And that about sums it up. What up and shalom. Welcome to the Rob and Caleb Show, the show where theology matters, scholarship counts, and theology matters. My name is Caleb Haig. With me, of course, Rob Van Hoff. What up, brother? How's it going? It's going well. Going well. I'm excited for the season we are in. Yes. That uh, building my sukkah. And yes. And what this season means is so important. Because we are justified not by our own works, but we're justified by what God did. And that's where our true joy is. Yes. So when our true joy, simcha. Preach. Right? Well, that's what it says. Have joy for seven days. Right? What, you know, and is that joy because I bought a new car? Yeah, I got the best car on the block now. I got the best, uh, you know, I don't know, my new shoes. I got the best shoes of all the people I know. You know, you know that's you know, not well, that's not where joy is, right? Just, just joy while you is were, boasting in, in what the Lord uh, has done for us. Just while you were saying that, you know what I thought of? You know, so, uh, you know a lot of those, like, uh, uh, Christmas movies where, like, you know, uh, one guy will, like, try to outdo the other guy's Christmas lights? It'd be funny to make a, a movie about Sukkot oh, uh, where where Chase, where two yeah. guys where two guys are trying to build the best sukkah. <laughs> it got like Cohen like Brothers a, movie. A, yeah, Cohen Brothers. He got like a double decker sukkah, right? <laughs> and then like all the things that that go wrong. Yeah, good times. I'm I'm I'm, I'm missing the uh, traditional the traditional button up shirt and and uh, vest today, man. Sporting the Yeshua shirt. Well, plot out. Yeah, I know what. Well, I I can make it up. For there you it, go. There with you it, go. With my uh, Yeshua I, shirt. I still think uh, that you and uh, I need to uh, buy our own merchandise and just be decked out in our own stuff. Maybe, maybe for show two hundred. Yes. Um, uh, okay. What up and shalom to everybody there in the uh, in the chat room. Uh, good to see people starting to trickle in. Um, it's a. Uh, it is a festival season, and. What? We hope that you're uh, getting ready for... Uh, people in the chat room are saying that they're getting ready. And uh, we hope that you're uh, preparing. Whether or not you support uh, uh, celebrate Sukkot or not, uh, this is a uh, wonderful time of the season. I love this. This is my favorite time of, of the year. You should. Yeah, you should celebrate you should Sukkot. Tell, no, yes. and, and the very deepest sense of the meaning is... We have to remember, this is where the, the culmination of the calendar, of the of really what is like a catechism for us. In other words, uh, uh, the curriculum of our memory of who we are. We start out the year as slaves, right? That's the original Mm -hmm. Nissan one. They're in slavery Yep. and they're redeemed, right? And then they're given here's, and they're redeemed, right? They're delivered from slavery according to God's purpose and a God's plan that is even before the slavery ever even happened. And then he says, this is the way to walk. Yep. Which exposes that other deeper problem where slavery came from in the first place, which is sin. But sin is dealt with in the seventh month, right? We have the blowing of the shofar on Yom Teruah, the yeah. call to, okay, God is king, right? And he knows the hearts. And he has something called sin in his dictionary, right? That it's a real thing that has to be dealt with. And we who worship him in spirit and truth have to come to the truth of the matter that, that if we say we have no sin, it says in first John that, that we're a liar. We're yeah. The truth and the truth is not in us. We want the truth in us, which means we need to see sin for what it is. And when that's confessed and all that's on, that's our, God is loving and forgiving and that's day of atonement. And then we have, 
simcha, right? Seven days of joy dwelling with God, not because we earned it, but because he delivered us and he is teaching us how to be his image bearers in the world. I, image bearer. I think I got that from uh, N.T. Wright. Image bearer. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, yes. so even if you're not going to build a sukkah physically, rejoice. Learn to identify where your joy, where eternal joy comes from. That's right. It doesn't come from anywhere but from what God has done for us by his grace and, and for his glory and his love for us. And that that dwelling with him, that koinonia, as it says in First John, that we have with the Father and with the Son in the Ruach as a community, is all it's all packed in there. We're we're redeemed. We are not slaves to this world. We are free. Now, are you the kind of person who uh, who really goes all out with the suka building and everything? Eh, I mean, is I, it a is it a huge I've, ordeal? My sukkah, well, just this morning I got out all the boards and I have them marked because I use um, basically the basic framework is two by fours with, you know, what, two and a half inch wood screws or whatever. Yeah. And so all, the, all the holes are already drilled. Yep, you so just I, just go, use a, I just go. <laughs> but what I have to do is go and figure out where all the boards were and I have them marked. And, and so I have it all laid out on the grass. But it's not a sukkah that I could, it, unless the weather is warm, there's no way I could stay at at night it's it's there's it's not a it's decorative let me just put it that way it's decorative it's, a, it's not it's a decorative it's not fully functional <laughs> right it's a decorative and we eat in it right we sure. you know, and i'll go out and, uh, and sit in it and study and and just pray and just have joy you know mm. um but it's not like a hardcore you know i'm gonna live in this thing for seven days i i haven't yet found a design that i really like but I'm, I'm probably due for a new sukkah, probably because the boards, I've been using these same boards for like, I don't know, seven years or so. So that some of them are cracking. I've had to replace some of the boards. Anyway. I'm debating just putting up a, a tent this year. Anyway, um, the other thing that we that Rob just said before we came on the air today was that we got about six weeks before we fly out for Rhode Island and Boston for the Evangelical Theological Society and the Soci well, yeah. so Society of Biblical Literature. And at this uh, at this year's uh, function, uh, Rob Van Hoff will be presenting two papers uh, in two different sections, one in the Missouri section and one in the, is it Galatians section? On Galatians, yeah. You, and so it's like I've got, I've got these different compartments in my brain that are like both – you know, uh, really into the weeds on details and they're just different than each other. It's, it, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, the Masora is dealing with medieval, uh, rabbinic Aramaic, you know, or, or, uh, scribal comments and interaction between scribes and rabbis and Catholic, uh, monks. And then on the other hand, it's the Greek text of Galatians in the middle of the first century, Jewish sectarian prepare for a ro prepare for a roasting on that one, man. The guys in in the Galatians study have a very set idea of what they. I mean, there's not a whole lot of, you know, back and forth of oh, this is what you know. Anyway, okay, let's get to it. We got a lot to get to today, and all of it comes from one place. Now, um, if you don't get our show notes, you certainly should, uh, and you can do that by going to torresource.com, hovering over. That's the second should yes. today. Yes. You should celebrate you should. Sukkot. And you, you should, should get our get show them. notes, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, go to, go to torresource.com and hover over radio. Go down to the Rob and Caleb show. Once you click on that, you can sign up for our show notes on the right-hand side. And I would encourage you to go there. Our uh, our uh, website has been complete, or the, our web page, rather, has been completely redone, and it's looking great. We're making changes to it every week. Um, so before we get uh, too deep into this, and I don't want to forget anybody, uh, let's start by saying that uh, The Rob and Caleb Show is brought to you by... Oh, that's our comment line. I'm sorry. Wrong one. Let's try a top one. Here we go. Chava Messianic Radio. Go to Chava Messianic Radio and listen to all sorts of Messianic uh, music 
uh, music for Yeshua's disciples. And as we tell you every time, the nice thing about Chava Messianic Radio um, is that you can select the different uh, songs you want to hear, rate stuff, you know, put together playlists, the whole nine. And, uh, and so it's really, uh, if you, if you're into messianic, uh, music, then Chava Messianic Radio is definitely something that you're going to want to check out. Um, and then also, and be uh, sure to request, uh, blow the trumpet inside. <laughs> uh, okay. And then also, uh, don't forget to go over to our good friends at Yeshua shirts. See this shirt I'm wearing? It says Yeshua on it. And you and too, see this mug that yeah, I'm drinking out of? You too can have cool clothes that say Yeshua on them. Start a conversation today. Uh, and do it with, uh, with some Hebrew lettering and, that says and Yeshua. If you, if you have a wife... Buy one for your wife. If you have, if you're a wife that has a husband, buy one for your husband. Buy yes. one for your kids. My wife has one she was wearing yesterday. I was like, what? Right on. So, um, yeah, and uh, don't forget, of course, to go to torresource.com. Uh, you know, I'm the more I'm trying to promote things on our site, the more I realize just the. I mean, it's an ocean of of uh, material that we have on Torah Resource, and a lot of it for free. Um, a lot of the time, I go into the articles section and i've just totally forgotten that we have so many articles on so many you know I'll, wow i didn't realize that we had something on this subject uh so it really is a good uh, a good resource and of course uh we like to hear from you and the way that we uh the way that we structure this show is we a lot of the time we uh, respond to emails and or uh to our comment line you can call the Robin Caleb Show comment line 253-465-3205. I'll give it to you one more time. It's 253-465-3205. And, of course, send us email, chag at torresource.com. Okay, now that that's all over, let's get to the, the uh, article at hand. This, um, some people might know this, some people might not. It's a little magazine called Petah Tikva. Uh, Petah Tikva is... Produced by a gentleman, actually, I would consider him at least a, a very good acquaintance, if not a friend. His name is Rick uh, Cham Chamberlain. He's out of New York. Uh, Rick is uh, a member of the UMJA uh, conference that we've uh, that Rob and I both have spoke at before, and uh, one that I've attended many, many, many times. Um, and uh, their annual meeting is usually over in Spokane. And so, if you've heard of uh, my father and I going over to Spokane to visit Rob and go to the UMJA conference, that's uh, that's it. Well, uh, Mr. Chamberlain is there. Uh, usually every year, and uh, so I've had a chance to sit down and have uh, lunch and dinner, break bread with uh, with Mr. Chamberlain, um, and so he uh, he always writes in you know articles in his uh, in in this little magazine that gets put out, and um, so this is from volume thirty five, number four. October through December 2017. The name of this article is What Were the Original Languages of the New Testament Scriptures? For those who have followed uh, Torah Resource or even the Robin Caleb Show for a long time, you know that I have also written a article back, I don't know, what, five years ago or so, maybe six years ago, called In What Language Were the Synoptic Gospels Written In? You can find that in your show notes if you uh, receive our show notes. You can find a link to that. Now, uh, Patatikva is not up online, uh, at least not that I could find. So I couldn't find a digital copy for you. So uh, uh, I thought about scanning it, but I didn't have permission from Mr. Chamberlain to do so. And uh, so I didn't, I, didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to misuse something, especially seeing as though I thoroughly disagree with Mr. Chamberlain on his, uh, on his assertions here. Um, but the, now we've... I should also say that Rob and I have talked about the uh, original languages of the apostolic scriptures before. When I say apostolic scriptures, that's the way that I reference the New Testament. Um, and I don't know if we've ever talked about why we call them apostolic as opposed to New Testament. Um, but that's maybe for a, a different conversation. Okay. So um, looking at this, um, it's not just a – this will bring up a lot of different uh, uh, topics. We've talked on the original languages of the Apostolic Scriptures before, and this is on the original language of the, of the uh, Apostolic Scriptures, but there's so much more packed into here that we can talk about. Um, and beyond that, what we really want to do is kind of look at the way that uh, Mr. Chamberlain has written this and some of the claims that he makes. Uh, for those who listen to this show on a regular basis, you know that we try to put a very high emphasis on scholarship and the, and the correct way to do 
essentially do scholarship, whether or not we agree with you or not. Uh, we can thoroughly disagree with you, and there's a good way to do scholarship and still disagree. Uh, you know, I often bring up uh, uh, someone like Daryl Bach, who uh, I see every year at the ETS and SBL, uh, and I've interviewed uh, Mr. Mr. Bach. He's he's a uh, he's a good he's a good scholar. Um, but I do disagree with him uh, on a lot of things. And he's he actually is a, a scholar of, of uh, his main field of study is Luke Acts, which is where my head is right now because I've been studying Luke uh, 22 for my thesis. So um, anyway, let's take a look at this. I don't know how much of this we actually want to read. However, I believe we have to read the first paragraph to give our audience just a, a general idea of Can where I mention that you did actually you and I both have reached out to uh, Rick Chamberlain in advance of uh, you know with full knowledge that we are going to be interacting well it's not just Rick with... uh, it's not just Rick actually uh, one of the practices that I've started to make on on this show uh, which I started to implement about a month and a half two months ago if we're going to talk about somebody that we haven't contacted already before so, for instance, we, we've talked about someone like Zach Bauer on this show many times. Um, I'm not going to contact Zach every time that we're going to talk about something that he that he uh, puts out. Um, same with someone like uh, Monty Judah. But, um, yes, uh, if we're going to uh, talk about someone's uh, position, especially if we disagree with it, I tend to shoot emails to that, that person and tell them that we're going to be talking about uh, something that they've written or something that they've put out and um, just let them know that that's, you know, that's our intention. And uh, I asked Mr. Chamberlain if there was anything that he wanted to clarify in his article or anything that he wanted to retract. Um, and he, he said, no, he stands by everything that he wrote. Uh, with that being said, let's dive right in. And, and okay, what, so today uh, we're going to spend our show... Um, just going through this, but Caleb and I have independently read this article and have different uh, co sets of comments. So we may we not think. get through we it think. all. Yeah. Well, we, yeah. I, I, we we haven't might be compared, responding to different. <laughs> we haven't compared uh, notes. Uh, we that, haven't compared notes. Uh, that's something so that we're. It, yeah. We're going to do what we can, and and if if this seems like a worthy conversation, which of course is, we might extend it into next week as well. There's um, a lot to talk about here. Because because the bigger issue has to do with what kinds of questions are good questions to ask. Yes. Um, what are the facts of the matter when, it, when, it, when we talk about original languages and manuscripts that we have? And what kinds of training is uh, part of the deal? You know, what, part of the deal. If I'm... If I'm uh, uh, working as an archaeologist in Israel, let's say, and we uncover a, a ancient synagogue, and there's an inscription there. Well, all the Hebrew word pictures in the world are not going to help me interpret that inscription, yeah. right? And if it's never been translated before, I can't go to the library and look it up what the translation is. Sure, I have to. Ha I have to be there uh, with a skill set to be able to recognize uh, what the letters are you know, and be able to interpret what the language is. And that takes a certain level of skills in, in languages. And of course, if you're doing archaeology, there's a whole set of uh, skills and methods pertaining to that discipline as well. So um, what, uh, just to set people up with my conclusion is that what we're going to see with this article are many falsehoods that are being taught. Um, and I think, sadly, I think, um, not the necessarily. Author, the yeah, author okay. doesn't recognize them as falsehoods. I don't believe he's deliberately misleading people. I think he's what we're seeing is a, is an untrained voice tell, telling people information versus a trained. Uh, we're going to contrast this with what, in fact, uh, the truth of the matter is okay, on a I, number I, of claims. I agree with you, maybe to an extent. However, I also think you know there. Um, I have one specific person in mind who has done an, a significant amount, amount of work in biblical studies. They haven't done that in school, um, but they have gone to school for other things. And um, the thing that they have done is picked up a, a specific way to research and a specific way to look into things. And uh, because of that, they've actually done very well in biblical studies and uh, have been able to write some 
good uh, some good articles that I've even that I've uh, utilized. Um, and I'm not uh, going to sit here and claim that I'm the greatest of biblical scholars or anything like that because I'm not. Um, I'm I'm very much a student, but. I think what Rob, maybe what you're getting at is that there is a way to do things, and um, but ha- the other thing is, is that uh, the the author of this, Mr. Chamberlain, he's resting on a lot of other people's work, and those other people uh, also have have uh, made some missteps in and of themselves, um, but also one of the things that we'll see in in terms of uh, I used to. I used to write a very specific way. When I first started to write articles, I used to write a very specific way. And it was uh, by the heavy hand of my father saying, you can't say that. And this is why. And we'll look at, we'll look at some of the things, uh, some of the, I mean, uh, Mr. Chamberlain uses some of the exact same kind of phrases that I used to use that I don't anymore uh, for a very specific reason. And that's because someone came along uh, very early in my studies. Actually, the very first paper I ever wrote, my father came along and said, no, you can't say things like this. Okay, let's read the very first uh, half paragraph here, and uh, so we can give our audience a little bit of an understanding of where Mr. Chamberlain is coming from and what he's writing on. Okay, he says while most of the Western uh, while while most of Western Christianity holds firmly to the belief that the New Testament was written originally in Greek, millions of Christians in the Eastern Orthodox traditions believe just as fervently that the New Testament was written originally in Aramaic. There can be some room for disagreement regarding the original languages of most of the books of the New Testament. I already take issue to this because there can be a lot of disagreement regarding all of the books, right? All of there's not one book in the in the apostolic scriptures that people couldn't uh, couldn't uh, uh, debate over the languages, right? Anyway. Sure. Okay. Um, Books of the New Testament. However, it is documented beyond all doubts that the original gospel by Matthew was written in Hebrew, not Aramaic, and certainly not Greek. Okay, so we've talked about this as well, but let's see where he, why he's going to say that uh, it's documented beyond all doubt. And uh, once again, this is uh, putting up a... Uh, I, I don't even have a word for it, but uh, uh, making making your argument seem like it's greater than it is. In other words, if you don't believe, you know, if you don't see this, you're an idiot. It's kind of the way that it comes across, right? It's documented beyond all doubt. And so this is kind of one of that's the... Where, uh, that's where emotions, uh, kind of emotional and uh, exciting kind of sensational languaging takes the place of, of actual evidence with uh, claims built on a, you know, a rational assessment of the evidence. Okay, but let's see where he's getting it from. Sure. Um, he goes on, David Biven and Roy Blizzard wrote an ec- excellent book called Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus, which was published by Maker Foundation, Arcadia, California, blah, 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 1983. Biven and Blizzard presented a considerable amount of extra biblical evidence for a Hebrew original of the Gospel of Matthew, particularly with quotes from many of the Antinician church fathers, that is, the leaders of the Christian church prior to the Council of Nicaea in 325 CE. Biven and Blizzard provide us with the following quotes from the church fathers on page 45 to 48. Now, should we read maybe one or two of these? He gives... Uh, he well, gives... Here, here's the thing. Here's one thing just where... Because a lot of points, I'm going to where Chamberlain is being what we would call critical. He's trying to come and and think rationally and critically, but he's not being critical enough. And and, and that's overall criticism I have of his articles. He, he he's not critical enough. His his laser isn't isn't precise. And to quote Antinician church fathers, so that's before Nicaea. But his source for these are all Eusebius. Yes, correct. Um, so, in other words, but by the way, he'll quote, our, he'll quote Irenaeus, he'll quote Origen. Irene, uh, Origen he puts to the fourth century, and no, Origen was second century, second third century. Eusebius is the source for all these quotes. But so hey, this Eusebius. isn't him. Wait, hang on, just a sec. He's not putting. I don't believe that he is putting uh, Origen in the fourth century. I believe that. Um, I'm not positive. No, he is. But he I think is. the bit, quotes the quotes are only from Well, he, I have the book right here. Clear. Let's take a look. Hang on just a sec. Let's just take a look. Go to pages 45 to to 40. I have the second edition 
Uh, so oh. it's actually page 23. Um, so he Maybe says, Ep- 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 Nights, um, come on, Matthew writes, no, you're right. It doesn't look like he's, they're giving dates. Yeah. So, so there's some chronological fuzziness that, uh, Chamberlain has here. Which to be is, honest with you, if that was the worst of it, then I would totally. No, no, uh, that I, it's just a point that that it this claim is can, we can already take. Oh, this is this was said in by Irenaeus. Well, uh, Irenaeus, according to Eusebius, and so Eusebius, who knows? What if Eusebius in the fourth century? Right, he was he was uh, bishop of Caesarea on the water. You know. Why not? Maybe his motive was to try to push that there was this Hebrew Matthew going around, and he just put it into the mouths of these, you know, of but, these all these like, all these earlier people. We, but by the way, Bobby's in the uh, chat room, and he says that uh, the 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 term for that for what I'm trying to say is gaslighting. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Gaslighting. Yes. All right. Okay. So uh, let's read one or two of these quotes. Okay. Just uh, just to give the audience an idea of of why um, Chamberlain would make a statement such as uh, it is documented beyond all doubts. Uh, Eusebius quoting Papi- Papius, Bishop of Hippolytus, uh, writes: Matthew put down the words of the Lord in the Hebrew language, and others have translated them each as uh, as best he could. Irenaeus uh, states, Matthew indeed produced his gospel written to the Hebrews in their own dialect. On origin writes, the first gospel, or actually just the first, composed in the Hebrew language was written by Matthew for those who came to faith from Judaism. Now, this sounds like a slam dunk, and and so it's understandable why um, Biven and Blizzard would, would put these things here. However, Biven and Blizzard didn't really do their their research very well. Um, actually, there's another article that I just picked up. Um, Craig Evans has now written on this as well. Oh, good. Um, however, I've, I disagree with him on some of the things. I'm going to actually try to find him at the uh, SBL and talk to him. So um, let's listen. You know, we've talked about James Edwards and his fantastic book uh, before, but let's uh, take a couple of quotes from him. He says, the traditions of the original gospel written in Hebrew is attested by 20 church fathers. Okay, 20 church fathers. He lists all of them. He says, when references to, and I'm going to skip all of them, when references to the Hebrew gospel by Pope Damasus, the Islamic Hadith, the Scholia of Sinaiticus, and Tractate Shabbat 116 in the Babylonian Talmud are added to this number, the list lengthens to over two dozen different witnesses. So this seems pretty damning in terms of the idea that there was, that the gospel of Matthew was written in Hebrew, unless that is until you actually start digging a little deeper at all. Uh, Because if you read these church fathers, then you'll understand that there's uh, something else going on here. Uh, Edwards goes on, the Hebrew gospel is therefore identified by name in at least two dozen patristic sources. Each source mentions it at least once and most mention it several times. Twelve fathers attribute the Hebrew gospel to the apostle Matthew and 11 specify that it was written in Hebrew. Um, Okay, hang on just one second. So he goes on, Origen's work uh, concentrates overwhelmingly on the four canonical Gospels. But on occasion, he references, and not disparagingly, to to non-canonical Gospels. Among these are the Gospel of Peter, the Proto... The uh, I can't even say it, of James, and the Gospel... There you go. And the Gospel of Hebrews... The saying preserved by Clement can scarcely be a compilation from the Gospels since three-fifths of it is absent from the Gospels. The sayings preserved by Clement certainly derive just as he attested from the Hebrew Gospel. Now, uh, what is striking to me is when I was doing work on the formation of the of the biblical canon, they list the, the Gospel of Matthew and then they list the Hebrew Matthew or the Hebrew Gospel as not canonical. 
it doesn't take very much to realize that there's two different books. There's one that's the, the canonical Matthew that we have, and then there's one that's the uh, attributed to Matthew, whether or not it is or not, we don't know, um, but attributed to Matthew written in Hebrew. That is non-canonical. That was uh, take that was right. not allowed into the canon, and was taken by the Ebionites all the way up until the fourth century. And we have we have snippets of it throughout the Church Fathers. Yeah, and the quotes in it have are not are not from the gospel what we think of traditionally as the Gospel of Matthew. Right, there's things quoted in it that are not in uh, our Gospel of Matthew, and so people two thirds of it, right? Yeah, yeah. They, uh, so. That's just an important uh, piece of, of nuance, right, of discernment that we need to keep in mind. Okay, so do we want to – how do you want to tackle this? Well, I mean, I, I just want to I, – I just would really like to emphasize one more time what Chamberlain and also what Biven and Blizzard have overlooked. They're attributing the Hebrew Matthew or the Hebrew Gospel – they they think it's the same as the canonical right. If I remember Matthew. right, I have the I have the book. But what they did is they started. They argue that Luke was the first gospel and it was written in Hebrew. Yeah, which and is so a what fallacy they did, in of itself. They, they took the gospel of Luke and they translated it from Greek back into Hebrew and try to capture what the original yes uh, was right and. I think Chamberlain takes his, Chamberlain's not comfortable with that move. I think in in his article here, I don't think he. No, but uh, after the, after he quotes these and and uh, doesn't understand that that uh, the Hebrew Matthew is uh, is not the canonical Matthew. Uh, this is what Chamberlain says, and this is this really really kind of got to me. He says, "The undisputable fact is that Matthew wrote his gospel in Hebrew, certainly not in Greek." Yeah, that's just that's not true. We have, that's, well, not only is it not true, but anytime you say use a, a term like, especially in a, in a scholarly setting, uh, the undisputable the undisputable fact. What are you talking about? Every fact is disputable when it comes to scholarship, and that's what scholarship is: is trying to see if it, you know testing things. Right, right. And I mean, it's very. I can't stand, and the reason why is because I think I tried to use a statement somewhat like this in the very first article I ever wrote for Torah Resource Institute, and I just got slaughtered for it. I mean, there was red all around it, X through it, you know. Well, here's the last (laughs) sentence in that same paragraph that Chamberlain writes. He says, since Yeshua taught in Hebrew to a Hebrew audience, many theological controversies are rendered meaningless when understood against a Hebrew background. Um. In other words, he says, Yeshua taught in Hebrew. He takes it for granted. Since Yeshua, since it is true, right, that Yeshua taught in Hebrew to a Hebrew audience, then when we understand this, all these, there's many theological controversies, he says, that, that just simply, he doesn't tell us which ones, what, which theological controversies well, are solved, uh, what, but the- he just says... The bigger the bigger issue, and maybe for people who might not understand what we're taking issue with here in our audience, the fact of the matter is is that we don't have any evidence. What we don't have evidence that Yeshua taught only in Hebrew, predominantly in Hebrew, or that you know, or that his audience spoke predominantly Hebrew. We just don't have any. The Bible doesn't tell us that. We we have no evidence, and even outside of the canonical scriptures. We don't have any textual manuscript evidence of this. But but what we – now, in all fairness, what we do have is it seems like we have a, evidence that shows that Yeshua taught in Greek and that he and that he spoke at least and probably taught sometimes in Aramaic. And it's definitely, uh, I would say, strongly arguable that not only could he read but understand Hebrew because he got up to read out of the scroll in the mm-hmm. synagogues, Right. So we know that, that Hebrew was used uh, in the reading of the scrolls in the synagogue, uh, especially in Judea, and, and Hebrew was probably used in Judea. We see this in Josephus. Um, but how far outreaching it was from there, and even, how mu- even if it was the, uh, the predominant language within Judaism in Judea is even arguable there, Greek was certainly the lingua franca of the day, the lingua franca. Franke, Franke. Franke. Yeah. He goes on to say then to to demonstrate that Hebrew would have been the language, Caleb, he says, uh, this is Chamberlain again, uh, page 11, 
Some 5,000 rabbinic parables from the period of time have come down to us, all in Hebrew. So he's saying that, that we have 5,000, roughly, rabbinic parables from Yeshua's day, all, all in Hebrew. I would love to see those. I think that many scholars would love to see those. Boy, yeah. I mean, if, it, that, if, if he could demonstrate that claim, he would be... You know, he would be pretty uh, in demand. People would be wanting him to come speak. He'd be selling books. Um, this is just not true. Well, yeah, the the fact that for, uh, for, for this those is not who, true at all. For those who don't that, listen to this show very often, the first manuscript, I, I believe, and maybe I'm wrong, but I believe that what Chamberlain is referring to is the Mishnah. Um, and no, or, he's talking about rabbinic parables. He says parables, which is going to be midrash. Okay, so even then, where's I mean, where's he going to get the oldest midrash we have? The oldest rabbinic midrash is Mechilta de, Ra, uh, uh, de Rabbi Eliezer, or no, uh, Mechilta de Rabbi Ishmael, which is Ishmael. I love seeing your century rabbi. I love seeing yeah. your mind trying to to even try to date it because it's hard to date it because we don't know we. we you know, where's the earliest manuscript it's like that we have? Second, third century. Yeah, we the earliest manuscripts are all medieval. We don't yeah. have we we don't have any. Yet yeah, these claims are just uh, unfounded. What we have from what we have to ask, and this is why he's not critical enough. We need to say, well, what do we have from the first century? What do we have that we can say, yeah, this was from the first century? We we go to the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have. You know, we just have the, everybody knows what they are. It's Philo, Josephus, the apostolic writings, all the Apocrypha, right? All the Jewish writings that were in Greek. Um, at the, and here's the thing. We have so much Jewish writing in Greek in the Second Temple period. Just so much of it. In Greek, yeah. In Greek. Why? Why do we have uh, all the books of Maccabees in Greek? Why do we have um, Judith? And uh, oh, the Susanna Torah. Why, why, and why do you the have the Tobit? Why do you have the Torah in Greek uh, at, in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah, exactly. So, so um, okay. But here's the thing: Jews were translate. We know this from at least from second second century BC in the Maccabean era. We had Ben Sirah being translated from Hebrew into Greek. We had the Book of Tobit being translated from Hebrew into Greek. We had. Um, the Book of Jubilees as it was going to be was being translated into Greek. Enoch was being translated into Greek. This is for Greek speaking Jews, yes. right? Yep. So Josephus wrote in Greek. Philo wrote in Greek. There's Jewish Greek culture, and it has nothing to do with Hebrew mindset versus Greek mindset kind of thing. It has to do with just the living language that people were speaking in, hmm. and um, so. We've got to have this. There's one more comment here as that paragraph goes on to the top of page 12. Oh, yeah, this, he says, wait, wait, this, this, this is, this is one of the comments that I, that I really, uh, that really boiled my blood here. Go for Cham it. Chamberlain writes the whole sentence, quote, no Aramaic inscriptions no, from he the says, Roman. Wait, start, start earlier. He says, ex extensive archaeological excavations since 1968 have taken place in Israel. No Aramaic inscriptions from the Roman period have been found. Okay, I, and then no, there's no citation there to that claim. No Aramaic inscriptions from the Roman period. This is just... The, <clears throat> if you go to Brown University's Inscriptions of Israel-Palestine, and you click, you, you, you click the language is Aramaic, and you click like 100 BC to 400 uh, Common Era, you get like at least 400 hits of Aramaic inscriptions from the land of Israel in the Roman period. Exhibit B. I have here now. I, I, I as soon as I saw this quote, I you know I jumped online because um, I I knew that there was problems with this, um, and I, I wanted to buy the book. There's a book by John F. Healy called titled Aramaic Inscriptions and Dema uh, Documents of the Roman Period. That's the name of the book. So his claim is that there's no Aramaic inscriptions from the Roman period uh, at all. They, they, none have been found. Yeah. There's a book called Aramaic Inscriptions and Documents of the Roman Period by Gen, uh, uh, John F. Healy. Now, the book was over $100, and I wasn't about to go try to, to rush it here uh, just so I could show it. 
Uh, instead, I, I downloaded uh, two reviews, actually. One of them is in your show notes, and that's the one I'm going to read from. Uh, I'm just going to read you the first uh, two paragraphs here. Uh, this person says, Healy's volume is pre presented as a continuation of John Gibson's textbook of Syrian Semitic inscriptions series, which appeared in the three volumes from 1971 and 1982. He presents here a selection of 80 texts, 80 texts from five dialects of Middle Aramaic. The collection ranges from the 2nd century BC to the 4th century AD, and so is broadly contemporary to the period of Roman interest in the Near East. I mean, th this is simple. I, like, I don't know. I don't even know where he would, why he would think this. Why, why Chamberlain would think that there's well, no. He's try what he's trying to say, he, he says this shows that Hebrew was the language of Jesus. Yeah, but it's just not true. I don't. Right. I mean, In other words, I don't understand no, where. Of course, but is it a Google he's, search he's that he false? But that's my point: is that he I don't understand. He doesn't cite it. He doesn't give us any. He doesn't tell us how he knows. Yeah. So this is uh, an example. This is not just simply not true. And sadly, I don't know how many people are reading this and consuming it as if this is true. True. Because yeah. wow, if if what he says is true here, then there are consequences. Then it then the consequences. A I. I have to be suspicious about the scriptures that I have as the New Testament, right? I have to be suspicious about, about do we have scriptures we can trust? Okay, and, th and this is a great point because uh, this is actually what he alludes to here. He says on page 12, Biven and Blizzard contend that many mistranslations of language, concepts, and idioms can have far-reaching theological ramifications. In other words, your Greek text isn't good enough you won't understand the Bible correctly because you need it in Aramaic, right? Um, and then he has examples. Oh, wait, can I, just before that, on that same page? Sure. He quotes an Orthodox rabbi named Boscus who says that it was all written in, first in Hebrew and then translated into Greek. He, he just, That's the he, source, yeah. Yeah, it's Rabbi uh, Roscus from St. Paul, Minnesota, who's an Orthodox rabbi. He, he says that... Um, that it was all written in Hebrew first and then translated into Greek. So that's one of his sources. Oh, so some Orthodox rabbi said this, then, wow. Like, who is this guy? Why does his opinion matter? I mean, I could go take a... a <laughs> yeah, it's just... Okay, so it, I, I think let's skip over Isaiah 51 uh, one because... Uh, we'll... No, but we can do this. He says that in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5... Yeah. It should say, this is what uh, Chamberlain writes, Yeshu, quote, Yeshua's words should read, blessed are those who pursue righteousness. So that's his statement. Quote, Yeshua's words should read, blessed are those who pursue righteousness. Rather than blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. For righteousness sake. Yeah. He says that the Greek doesn't understand the Hebrew. Well, here's, here's just a handful of problems. A, we have it... Uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, which we we'll usually read, and uh, we have it in the Nephal, near Daf, and as persecuted, and it's translated that in Greek. So Jewish Greek already has this. It's in uh, First and Second Maccabees. It has Israel being persecuted and pursued in the passive voice. Multiple times in Josephus, which is Greek, of Israel being persecuted or pursued, not pursuing. It's just a passive voice. And this is just super, super frustrating to read this kind of claim because it. Looks, wait, wait, hang on, hang on. Let's he's let's quoting a Hebrew root. Let's ex it, it, let's explain that to our audience a little bit more, though. The point is, is that the Greek, what uh, what Chamberlain is going to uh, argue here is that uh, is that Yeshua would have used a Greek word radaf. I no, well, that's the radaf is the Hebrew that it, the that Hebrew. it should be read actively. That blessed yeah, are those yeah. who pursue righteousness, not blessed are those who are pursued because of righteous or persecuted but the greek can do both and, and yeah and, just as the hebrew can do both yeah just it, as the hebrew can do it's both a non, it, this is like a nothing it's, burger it's a, yeah it's a total non-issue no, that's the well, point it's not even a nothing but he's it's it is an inflated false claim that is misleading and it's sad to, to see someone who's a who's a teacher that i, I imagine has quite a bit of i mean he's sending out this newsletter for decades, I believe, yeah. um, that is so um, 
that that lacks the critical skill to discern this kind of thing and teach his audience a higher level of discernment. It's, it's, now there it's, are there are schol- there are scholars who are going to argue that certain books might have been written in in Hebrew or Aramaic, um, but. I mean, the the arguments are are few and far between, and the reason why is because uh, good critical scholarship is going to say that it's very unlikely most of the time. Let's go on here, though, and and this is where uh, uh, Chamberlain is going to part with uh, with Biven and Blizzard. He says, where I part company with Biven and Blizzard is that these men then go on to try to reconstruct the Hebrew gospel backwards from the Greek Matthew, which they recognize as a translation, which was originally translated from this article, uh, from the Hebrew, I'm sorry. Uh, This would be like someone taking this article, translating it into Finnish, and then someone else translating it back into English. Now, this is the statement that I'm uh, that I'm going to focus on. This process that Biven and Blizzard went to is kind of unnecessary because there already are ancient Hebrew Matthew Gospels out there. Where? Okay, let's pause there. Yeah, where? Let's pause. <laughs> that, and no footnote. Yes. Well, no footnote on on. And then he goes, but he does go on to talk about quote George Howard. On the bottom of page 12 there, and he says, who tells of various other ancient Hebrew Matthews. Well, I have Howard's book here. As do I. The second edition here. Yeah. Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. And notice, uh, I put this in the show notes too. Notice that, uh, so Chamberlain is using the first edition. First edition. And the first edition's uh, name is different. The first edition is titled, The Gospel of Matthew According to Primitive Hebrew Texts. Yeah. And and did it, he he got roasted on a a few things and he re- he took it. It, he took it out of the out of the title. He yeah, took he primitive title. Uh, primitive Hebrew text out of the title because he got roasted so bad for and it. What and he, he knew clarifies it. what yeah. he, what what he clarifies here is that the now remember Chamberlain says George Howard tells of the ancient <clears throat> his wording ancient Hebrew Matthews. It's the second time in the article at least where he mentions ancient Hebrew Matthews. George Howard says. All the manuscripts date between 15th and 17th centuries. 15th and 17th centuries. If that's ancient, then... Is that ancient? That's 15th century. That means the the 1400s through the 1600s. That's that's early that's not, modern. Yeah. That's what we call early modern era. That's, that's, that's the Reformation. Uh, that's the era of the Reformation. That's the rise of the printing press. This is not ancient. And so ancient here, used in at least twice, talking about these ancient Hebrew Matthews, is, is false. Not only that, if you look up the, you know, I've got, um, thankfully, George Howard put a critical apparatus, as you can see. I'll just hold up a page here. You can see there's variant readings in the bottom. I looked up that Matthew 5 uh, <laughs> with the persecuted versus pursue the Hebrew Matthews that Chamberlain is advertising here read just like the Greek blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness so even the the only Hebrew evidence that Chamberlain has from these early modern manuscripts agree with the Greek that he's arguing against pro original hebrew yeah do you see that do you see the disconnect yeah. I, I don't know how to i don't know how to put that any clearer and, and on the same page he he's arguing about the original hebrew would have blessed are those who pursue righteousness and then with a flip of a coin he's or uh, you know in the next breath he's talking about all these ancient hebrew manuscripts which are actually early modern that agree with the greek against what he wants the original hebrew to say but he doesn't uh, that connection is not made. Uh, Chamberlain fails to notice that uh, that problem here. So for him, he's he's just building up a mountain of evidence to teach his readers that uh, a, a, as a comprehensive argument, right? He's making a, a comprehensive argument sure. here. So uh, let's change gears a little bit because um, what is going to happen here is that Chamberlain now is going to look uh, at a, another passage. And this is a passage that's actually really interesting. And I think that we can change gears a little bit and talk about this passage sp- specifically. We'll probably have to uh, come to the end of our time by the end of this, depending on how long we go on this. Um, he writes, um, and he's going to be looking at, 
So he, he brings up the doodle a and, um, which also is not ancient at all. Um, and there are chances that maybe it goes back to a more, uh, an older manuscript, but, uh, again, if we can't, we can't know what we can't show, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so otherwise I could just say, yeah, well, the Zohar was written in the second century. Yeah, exactly. Right? Well, I, I can't prove it, but so, um, he's talking now about the Hebrew versus, uh, the Greek trying to show that there's discrepancies within the Greek that can't be understood outside of the Hebrew. Um, so he says this also, he'll tell you what text below, by the way. So just hang in with me because we skipped a little bit here. Um, he's talking about, uh, yeah. Okay. So let's just read this, this portion. He says, this is also the text that was used by James Scott Trim in his Besserot Mati, the good news, according to Matthew, Trim points out that the genealogy of Yeshua should contain three sets of 14 names. And he references Matthew one seventeen, which is in your show notes as well. We'll read that in a few seconds. Um, uh, however, the Greek only contains 13 names in the last set, uh, which, well, we'll talk about this. The discrepancy takes us by surprise since the text indicates there should be 14 names. Our Hebrew text, however, does contain 14 names in the last list. In verse 13, we see the missing name Avner between Avihud and Eliachim. Since Avner looks in Hebrew similar to Avihud, it is apparent that a careless scribe looked back up to the list and picked up after Avner, mistaking it for Avihud. The scribal error shows clearly that the Hebrew text came before the Greek text, which is affected by the later scribal error. If this is a scribal error, it was a scribal error that was done in all of by all of the scribes. Right? Because the Hebrew, because all of the, uh, at least from what I understand, and I haven't been able to look at all of the Greek manuscripts, but the the uh, Greek manuscripts of Matthew leave, don't have a, a an extra name as the uh, much later Hebrew text does, which tells me, and I mean this is just uh, I mean uh, uh, interpreting the Bible, you know, good hermeneutics. What's one of the rules of biblical interpretation? The harder reading is usually the original reading, right? And the shorter reading is usually the original reading. Why? Because it's easier to add stuff than it is to take stuff out. According to the rules of textual criticism... Yeah, they, they the, usually say, you know, if it's a... Well, yeah, if you have multiple manuscripts, you're trying to say, is there any place we can discern? Yeah, that was probably added rather than left out. And we've seen this, like our Acts 15, Acts 21. I mean, there's sure. examples that are just bl glaringly obvious that a later scribe is adding information to try to put their theology into their copy. Okay, so inside of your show notes, ladies and gentlemen, I have put uh, the very first uh, the very first link that you'll see is called Chronology Found in Matthew 1, taken from Tim Hanks' commentary on Matthew Volume 1. This has all of them. This has uh, Matthew's, chron Matthew's chronology put against Luke's chronology in Luke 3, 23 through uh, 38. And it also puts it against the First Chronicles cr uh, chronology and then against the Hebrew Matthew, which is what Chamberlain is advocating for here. Um, as you can see, there is an extra one, um, which is the Av Avner, which is found in the Dutile. Okay. Um, so why don't you describe what you believe is going on here and maybe even some of the other suggestions for why we have a name missing in the Greek. Or it's, I don't think it's missing. I don't I, think there's a name missing. I don't think there's yeah. a name missing at all. In fact, I think this is exactly I, how it should be. And... You know, and there's different ways of reading it. I think uh, Tim Haig's commentary uh, on Matthew uh, helps get into that, uh, the different issues. I, I just have to pull it up here. In, in Matthew 1, I start here. I start with the first verse, which just says, uh, the son of Yeshua is the son of David, the son of Abraham, right? That's the core picture here. So it starts with Yeshua, anchors Yeshua to David, and then anchors David to Abraham. And then in verse 17, it says, all 
uh, the gen- uh, generations from Abraham to David, 14. From David to the deportation of Babylon, 14. And then from deportation of Babylon to to Christ, or Messiah, 14 generations. Okay. So notice there's a person missing, right? We go Abraham to David, David to an event, and then an event to Messiah. Yep. Right? It's not it's not Abraham to David, David to another person, another. So there's one of the links of the 14 is not a person but an event. And if we and so my argument is that the proper way to understand the accounting is from Abraham means you start Abraham is one. From David means you start another one. So in other words, from uh, if we go from David, or from, sorry, from Abraham to David, and you look at the way he lists it, sure enough, Abraham is one, David is 14. Yep. Then, then it says from David to Babylon. So you count, now David is one, and you get to... Uh, Josiah. Josiah. And it, then it says who, who is at the time... And he, and he has a whole narrative there in, um, that's back in verse 11. Josiah is the 14th, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation. Then it says, after the deportation, Jeconiah became the father. So I believe you're supposed to start counting then the last 14, not from Josiah, but from Jeconiah. And that puts Yeshua as the 14th. So it's if you take Mary out, yeah, because yeah, 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 you wouldn't can't you don't. I, count I agree, I agree. Yeah, so that's the way I read it. To me, there's not it's a non-issue, but Chamberlain sees this as an important issue that demonstrates that that weakens confidence in the Greek Matthew that we have. So let me restate for for our audience uh, what what Rob is saying is that you count David twice, and the reason why is because of in seventeen it says so all the generations from Abraham to David which means you start with Abraham, you end with David, are 14 generations. From David to the deportation of Babylon, that means you would start counting with David. Right, just like you started with one with Abraham, from yeah. Abraham. Then you, then you count to, to Josiah, that's 14 generations. Uh, uh, from uh, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. So all of your generations are there. And actually... Rob and you is, could you could even theologically ask why does he not he doesn't want to mention uh, why does he mention it uh, not a name there right Bab- why is the de- deportation to Babylon being highlighted in Matthew uh, Matthew's initial, uh, uh, first chapter and particularly in verse seventeen because th- that was t- sin right that's where Daniel. Yeah confessed the, all of Daniel 9. We have sinned. We have we are under the curse of the Torah. Yeah. That's what Daniel says. And yeah. how many Jews returned? <clears throat> how many came back? There's a lot of Jews stayed in Babylon. Yep. They didn't come back. And 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 uh, the end of our canon is of our uh, uh, Tanakh canon is Nehemiah. Basically saying, you know, even the people that came back, they're not, they're not walking in the Torah. They're working on Shabbat. They're, they're, I mean, he's like, Lord, remember me for good, right? That's, yep. he's like, he's, it's like, look at, you've seen what I've tried to do here, you know? Um, so let's so, read out, let's read out of this too, because uh, this is the International Critical Commentary on Matthew 1 through 7 uh, by Davies and Allison. They, they give a, a couple of, uh, well, actually, they give the same view as you, right? From Abraham to David, there are, in fact, 14 generations, and from David to the deportation of Babylon, another 14. But from the deportation to the Christ, there appear to be only 13 generations. Numerous attempts have been made to explain this inconsistency. Some have proposed that a name has inadvertently dropped out from the third section, or that Mary should be counted in addition to Joseph, or even that Yeshua in his first advent is the, four, is the 13th. Messiah, in his second advent, the 14th. A more plausible solution counts David twice at the end of the first ta- uh, Tasser Desad and at the beginning of the second, and makes Josiah conclude the second section. Jokaniah opened the third, yet David alone would then be counted twice, certainly an odd circumstance, and Jokaniah is most naturally included in the second section. 
Yeah, that's that's sounds like the way I take it. Yeah. Um, uh, but anyway, the, the point is, is that uh, I, I mean, I, I always find it interesting when people say, well, I don't understand this passage. Something mu- must be wrong with the passage. Yeah, oh, uh, when Chamberlain uh, writes this. Descri- oh, no, he's quoting James Trim, though, right there, I think. Yeah, J- yeah James Trim. Oy. Um, so, yeah, but but the, the point is, is that is that no, the text is not wrong. It's that we don't we might not understand the text. But the text itself is not wrong. I mean, there's certainly a reason that there there isn't that that fourteenth one. It's not that all of a sudden we have to to uh, think that it was written in a different language. Um. Well, should we skip and do one more of these before? We, uh, and this one, I mean, this was probably the the worst uh, uh, thing that I found in the entire article. This is on page thirteen. He says, uh, it should be noted at this point that for uh, for most of the books of the New Testament, the oldest existing manuscripts are in Aramaic. Oh, my goodness. Read that one more time. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to keep going with this but it, because there's a whole section here that I want to, that I want to read. This, I mean, I, I, I had to put the article down at this point. He gives no, by the way, he gives no reference. So let's so read this quote, again. The quote there is, the oldest existing manuscripts are in, in Aramaic. Aramaic. This does okay. Let's keep going. This does not necessarily mean that the original books of the New Testament were written in Aramaic. It may simply mean that the Greek manuscripts didn't fare as well in the damp climates of Europe as did the Aramaic manuscripts of the much drier Middle East. However, the fact that the oldest New Testament manuscripts are in Aramaic does lend credibility to the notion that the Aramaic New Testament predated the Greek New Testament. Uh, there's no uh, there's no note on what uh, Aramaic uh, he's he's attempting to say is the oldest. The oldest Aramaic uh, uh, manuscript that we have is from the sixth century. The earliest Greek manuscripts manuscripts that we have are from the second. And some even scraps, they believe, from the first century of Matthew, right? Um, P66 is a second century uh, manuscript in Greek, right? Uh, they- yeah, well, here. So here, here's an example, Caleb, of, of resources like, this is a good book we use in second year Greek, Stanley Porter, Andrew Pitts, Fundamentals of New Testament Criticism, which is what it's like Chamberlain is dabbling in kind of thinking about things about textual criticism, but there's actually people who are very trained. They know what the manuscripts are. They know the languages and they have methods that have been developed through debate and um, intense research and scrutiny of ideas here. And um, sadly, the author of our article today is is just really uh, unaware of this. it says, uh, according this is uh, Porter and Pitts, with the the oldest the old Syriac version, the manuscripts themselves probably copied in fourth or fifth century. The Syriac Peshitta that we have, it um, the oldest are fifth sixth century. So, yeah, it's 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 late. Whereas, and here's another really good book is uh, Larry Hurtado, The Earliest Christian Artifacts. We've talked about this before. But he just says, uh, uh, list the writings that came to form the New Testament that are witnessed in manuscripts dated to 2nd and 3rd centuries, common era. Matthew, we have 12. Mark, we have 1. Maybe more, who knows now. Luke, 7. John, we have 16. Acts, we have 7. Romans, 4. 1 Corinthians, 2. 2 Corinthians, 1. Galatians, 1. Ephesians, 3. Philippians, 2. Uh, so on and so forth. Hebrews, 4. James, 3. Revelation, 5. These are all 2nd and 3rd century, century Greek. Witness, Greek witnesses. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, the, 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 the notion that the, that the earliest claim, manuscripts... Yeah, the oldest the, existing manuscripts are in Aramaic is... is it's not true. Completely false. Yeah, it's totally it's, false. Yeah, it's, it's just not true. And so we have a string of, of fake pearls here uh, uh, to make this, this necklace, I guess, whatever you want to call this article. Um, Fail. <laughs> uh, let's end on, on one more uh, gaslighting comment, as, now that I have the term, gaslighting, right? Despite the overwhelming evidence... 
There will be some out there who will reject any idea that any of the books of the New Testament were originally written in any other language besides Greek. It is perhaps a religious conviction blindly held to by some and is somehow a threat to their faith to hear of any books of the New Testament being written originally in any other languages besides Greek. No, I believe that it's just simply looking at the evidence presented. Well, the problem that Chamberlain has in this article is that he has not presented any evidence whatsoever. And what he does is he makes a statement and then uh, builds upon his own statements. Or his, or well, for his example, he false pushes claims. that to say that he says it is highly unlikely that Paul wrote his epistle to the Romans in Greek. <laughs> in other words, he says that uh, uh, Rome was in Italy. They spoke Latin. Why would Paul write uh, in Greek to a bunch of Latin speakers? That's his that's his argument there. Well, I wonder, you know, I could ask, well, Josephus wrote in Greek. Josephus <laughs> was in Rome. Yeah. You know, we have all sorts of Greek texts that that uh, were what do you call it that had uh, distribution, you well, know, cor- correct, in, correct me in if the I'm, Roman period. Correct me if I'm wrong. I thought in Rome the only time that they really spoke Latin was in court. Greek was still well, we the know, lingua franca, right? Well, we was, know that that it, it, yeah, that's true. That in the Senate and stuff like that, and we have there's poetry in Latin. Latin was a, a, certainly upheld as a, as a, a, a core language, but it wasn't. Uh, but it but didn't Greek supersede. Cult, but Greek. they adopted Greek culture, yeah. right? They adopted Greek culture and valued Greek culture, though, although they Romanized it. Here's 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 one of. If I could share just one more thing, go for it. It's towards the end. Well, after, I'm, I'm happy to say he, he actually confesses he doesn't know Greek. He says, it's amazing that people actually uh, spoke such difficult languages. It's Greek to me. I don't understand it. In other words, so he, he says he doesn't understand Greek. But then he goes on to make this claim. One of the greatest dangers of the Greek language. Okay. So now it implies that Greek language is dangerous. One of the greatest dangers of the Greek language is that the study of Greek often leads to Greek thought patterns. Where's the data for that claim? (laughs) Those who study the Greek language also often, twice we have the word, often to go on study Greek philosophy philosophy and theology, which are often, (laughs) third time often, very contrary to Hebrew mindset and contrary to the God of the Scriptures. So in other words... Studying Greek is dangerous because it often leads to Greek thought patterns. It often leads to to study of Greek philosophy and theology. It that is just that's like saying that's just well. There's just no data for it. There's no data for it. What you know? It everybody every case is different. I I studied Greek to learn the language of the scriptures. There's yeah. other people who study Greek. I, when I took uh, Attic, you know, classical Greek in college, there were other people that weren't religious at all. They wanted to study Plato and Aristotle. But they were already thinking in Greek philosophical terms as yeah. a value for their life, and they studied Greek to support that value system. I was already immersed in Hebrew and Aramaic, and I needed to. I wanted Greek as well. And, and so it was, I'm learning Jewish Greek. So this, this is um, sad and frustrating um, but at the same time, I'm grateful that we have this opportunity and we're trying to, we're not trying to be mean here, but we are, we want to uphold the truth of the matter and to hold it out for people to hear and to think about that you, someone has to say that this is true and that this is not true, right? Someone has to be able to say, take these kinds of claims and Bring them to fully out into the light, and ex- it, so that they can be seen for what they are. And there are several—I don't know how many—but uh, just all the points that Chamberlain builds upon here is a is a, a house built on sand. This article is a house built on sand. Here's the and thing. Sadly, I don't know what the distribution is of people who read this and just say, "Wow." Because they, they themselves haven't been trained to think critically, and they don't know how, they don't know the larger context. Well, for me, the thing is, is that if, you know, I, I don't mind, uh, Chamberlain, unfortunately, uh, starts off, 
he gets off to a very bad start, right? He gets off to a bad start by uh, equating uh, the Hebrew Matthew with the Gospel of Matthew. And this is where, uh, in the very beginning, and this is where, uh, you know, uh, the problems begin. And, and uh, he doesn't gain control of the, of the argument again after that. Um, there are people who uh, believe in, in uh, Hebrew or Aramaic primacy for certain books of, of the Apostolic Scriptures. Um, but I have yet to see, you know, a lot of people try to argue this according to uh, Hebrew and Greek or uh, Hebrew and Aramaic idioms. The problem is, is that you have people who were Hebrews, right, who, who were living in, in a specific culture. And we're commanded to write to all the nations, and uh, Chamberlain even pretty much uh, contradicts himself in this. Um, the, the, they were told to go out to all the nations. Well, what, how would they if they're spe if they're writing in Hebrew? They're not going to hit any hardly anybody. They're going to hit a very very small sliver of Judea, and that's it. So if you have you know, it's like if I learned I don't know Japanese or something. If I'm writing in Japanese, you're still going to hear that my my American idioms and my American uh, thought patterns come through in that Japanese, even though I'm writing in Japanese, right? Why is that? Because I grew up in a Japanese, in a, in a American culture, not in a Japanese culture. So the idea of having all of a sudden Hebrew and Aramaic idioms and stuff like that come into the Greek, we would expect that from people who had a pre predominantly probably spoke Aramaic as a, as a, uh, first language and were trying to write in Greek. And we even see this from people like Mark. Mark Mark's Greek is not nearly as good as, say, Paul's Greek, right? Uh, it's actually, and Mark has the worst uh, Greek of all the all the Gospels. And so, uh, you know, we we see that they that they even struggle a little bit uh, in their in their own uh, in their own writing of of a uh, different language. But that doesn't prove that they wrote in Aramaic or Hebrew. It proves that they were Jews. So, I mean, the arguments that are put forward <clears throat> by people for Hebrew or Aramaic primacy, the problem is, is that there's not good, solid evidence to rest on. People want to rest on things like the Peshitta. They want to rest on, you know, other things that are, are uh, much, much later and say, well, this must go back to the original it's, because... It's a similar line of thinking of, like, why we would read the Babylonian Talmud. For example, I got an email um, today... Or was it last night? Someone asking about, um, I'll just give you the quick thing. I know we're maybe running long here. Oh, you're fine. He had just heard that, um, that there was in the first century, there was the expectation, um, that there are four miracles that only the Messiah would be able to perform healing a leper, casting out a mute demon, healing someone born, born blind and raising someone who had been dead three days. That like there like someone had this little handbook of how to recognize Messiah, right? And and it had just four things on it. Check and but the checkbox check by each one, and yeah. you would go and you would you know. Oh, you're missing this one. You must okay, not be the so, Messiah. Yeah. So the thing is, there is like, well, where does the idea come from? Well, there is no such text. You know, four things that we know Messiah is coming with. Yeah. And what what someone <clears throat> does, and um, there are different Jewish. Uh, evangelists, you know, in our day, I think that that actually really get a lot of mileage out of these kinds of myths and legends that come from much later rabbinic world, and then they try to cherry pick from those and then put it behind the gospel. And say, see, yeah, see, um, but it's really like a, it's like dealing from under the deck kind of thing. But they don't, uh, anyway. It's it's anachronism. It's taking stuff from later arranging it in a way and then trying to smuggle it into an earlier date. And, and that's just not, that's not good stewardship. Well, and we've seen this with other people. Well, you know. We can't do that in a court of law. <clears throat> yeah. I couldn't, I, if I was in a court of law before a judge and I have a letter and I say, judge, this letter was written by Abraham Lincoln and it shows that Abraham Lincoln did X, Y, and Z. And the judge say, well, let's look at it. Oh, well this, well, that was written in in eighteen hundred or, he, or in he, the year nineteen hundred. He references he was, a cell phone. This obviously was, can't. Be. Yeah, no, no, but well, that too. That's that's. A, <laughs> but if I say, but the manuscript you have, sir, the judge says, was written in the nineteen hundred. But I, but judge, 
yes, but it is it was copied from from an earlier time. No, it would be inadmissible as evidence, right? Yeah. You, you can't. Uh, but for some reason, we bypass that and we permit things into quote evidence. We smuggle things into evidence, which in fact uh, shouldn't pass the sniffer test. Yeah, evidence. of course. All right. Well, it is uh, some of the people in the chat room who are over in uh, England have already left uh, the chat room to go uh, to go uh, celebrate some coat. The pressure's on for me to finish my soaking now. Yeah, that's right. You got to do it. Um, we hope that uh, everyone enjoyed the show, and uh, we hope that uh, you've gained something from it. We do hope that this uh, season, this Sukkot, will be a very, very memorable one. That you'll have a joyous time in your Sukkah if you uh, if you have one. And uh, yeah, don't forget to give us a call, 253-465-3205. Shoot us an email, chag at torahresource.com. That's chag at torahresource.com. And uh, we hope that uh, the one thing that you do in your Sukkah this year is, as every year, is focus on the one who brings eternal life and salvation. And who is that? There's only one person who can do that. And that is our great God and Savior, Yeshua, the Messiah. <laughs>